note that throughout this video, when I say pressure function, I really mean pressure disturbance function, which is defined as follows. If there were no sound in the cavity, then the pressure would be uniform. It would be constant everywhere. The pressure disturbance function describes the deviation from this constant pressure due to sound. It's important to remember that both the pressure function and the pressure disturbance function satisfy the wave equation because they're only different by a constant. This constant difference also has no effect on the uniform density incompressible Euler equations because they only depend on the gradient of the pressure, which is important because we're going to use them to obtain the boundary conditions. In this video, we're going to calculate the resonance frequencies and associated pressure functions of a cuboid-shaped cavity with side lengths Lx, Ly, and Lz. To do this, we're obviously going to need to solve the wave equation, but since the wave equation taken on its own only describes free sound, we're also going to need something more. Something to account for the physical effects of the cavity walls on the sound carrying fluid. The plan for attacking this calculation has three steps. The first of these three steps will be to think a little bit about fluid dynamics in order to determine a set of mathematical constraints in terms of the pressure function that account for the physical effects of the cavity walls. The reason why we need them in terms of the pressure function is because that's what we're solving the wave equation for. So if we don't have constraints that show the effect of the cavity walls specifically on the pressure function, then we can't finish the problem. The second step will be to solve the wave equation in an appropriate coordinate system for a general solution onto which we can impose those pressure constraints. And then the third step will be the process of imposing those constraints itself. However, before we get started with this problem, we do need to figure out which coordinate system is most appropriate for this problem. The answer is clearly Cartesian coordinates. For one thing, the wave equation is separable in Cartesian coordinates. And also, whatever pressure function constraints we do have to impose in order to account for the physical effects of the cavity wall, will probably be simplest in form in Cartesian coordinates because the cavity is a cuboid shape. With the coordinate system selected, we can head straight into that plan that I listed previously, so let's start thinking about fluid dynamics. Thinking about this carefully, we know that the dominant effect of the cavity walls will be to make the perpendicular displacement of the fluid zero at the boundary for all time. This means that the perpendicular velocity component will also be zero at the boundary for all time because they're related by a time derivative. We also expect that that in any physically reasonable situation, the fluid carrying the sound will be of uniform density and virtually incompressible relative to the sound pressures involved. This is important because that means that we can use the incompressible uniform density Euler equations to relate velocity and pressure. Because it's the pressure that we're solving the wave equation for, but the direct effect of the cavity walls is on fluid velocity, such a relationship will allow us to extract constraints on the pressure function at the boundary that mathematically account for the effect of the cavity walls in terms of the pressure function. The these are the incompressible uniform density Euler equations. If we put the gradient in Cartesian coordinates, we get this three-vector equation. Let's write out the three component equations separately. If we apply to those equations what we know about the perpendicular component of velocity at the boundary, we obtain these boundary conditions. These boundary conditions are therefore the constraints that we need to impose on the pressure function in order to account for the physical effects of the cavity walls on the sound carrying fluid. With the boundary conditions figured out, we can move on to the second step in the plan that I listed towards the beginning, and that was solving the wave equation in Cartesian coordinates for some kind of general solution that we can then impose those boundary conditions on in the third step. As I mentioned when we were selecting the coordinate system, we're going to solve this equation via separation of variables. When I'm solving a partial differential equation via separation of variables involving both spatial variables and a time variable, I usually separate the time variable from the spatial variable first, and then separate the spatial variables from each other in sequence. Sequence. But this partial differential equation is so simple that we can basically do it all at once. So this is our separation onsatz. If we insert that into the equation and then divide by the onsatz, we get an equation where both sides depend only on variables that the other side does not depend on, which means they're not only equal to each other, but are also equal to a constant. This gives us two equations, an ordinary differential equation for the time factor and an equation involving the three spatial factors. We can then subtract the z term to the other side of the equation and the constant term to the side that the z term used
used to be on. And we again arrive at an equation where both sides depend only on variables that the other side does not depend on. And so again, they're not only equal to each other, but are equal to yet another constant. And we can then do this yet again to separate the x and the y variables, ultimately leaving us with this set of four ordinary differential equations, one for each of the different factors in the original ansatz. All four of these equations are of the form of a simple harmonic oscillator and are solved by sines and cosines, giving us these general solutions. I've written the time factor solution in a nice finished form, but I've left the general solutions for the spatial factors rough because we still have to impose the boundary conditions. Imposing the boundary conditions was the third and final step in that plan that I listed for attacking this problem, and it's imposing these boundary conditions that will ultimately give us what we're looking for, namely the harmonic frequencies and the harmonic pressure functions. Looking at the complete set of boundary conditions and all the spatial factor general solutions, we see that all of the boundary conditions are satisfied if we reject all the sine solutions and also set all the multiplicative constants in the arguments of the solutions, lowercase a, lowercase b, and lowercase c equal to some positive integer n, x, n, y, or n, z, depending on which solution factor you're talking about, times pi divided by the associated side length. Selecting these values for a, b, and c ultimately fixes k, where I've selected the positive square root here because we're interested only in positive harmonic frequencies, and by fixing k, those selections ultimately fix the harmonic frequencies. We're also ready to write out the associated harmonic pressure functions. All we have to do is multiply together all those finished solution factors, and beyond this we can write out a solution for arbitrary noise in a cuboid cavity. It's simply an arbitrary linear superposition of the harmonic pressure functions, where the a constants are the amplitudes and they're fixed by initial conditions. And with that we have the three key results that we need and we're done with the problem. I hope you enjoyed this video, or at least found it interesting. If you did, please consider sharing it with a friend, giving it a thumbs up, and subscribing.